All right, let's go ahead and get start recording because I want to talk about this. This is important. Uh, good morning. Today is October 11th. Uh, again, you've got the schedule. You know what we're doing. We have to finish up the rest of our bone physiology today, and we'll begin our, our introduction into joints, which we'll finish on Wednesday. We have our group presentations this week of the appendicular skeleton, uh, upper appendages, so uh, the pectoral girdle and the upper limb uh, today, and then pelvic girdle and the um, uh, lower appendages on uh, Wednesday. Uh, your unit nine review is due on Wednesday. Uh, I made a decision uh, last night as I was uh, working on grading the assignments. I realized that um, we're not going to get through all of the bones and bone figures, of, uh, uh, bones and bone features of the appendicular skeleton. In fact, half of them basically uh, by Wednesday. And so, since we need to know the bones and bone figures uh, features to be able to successfully complete the skeletal review, I decided that we would take advantage of one of the few benefits of being online uh, by having uh, by moving our thirty point skeletal review to, uh, due date till Friday. I don't normally like having things do when we're not in class because it is easy to forget about those types of things. And again, it is vitally important that you turn these things in on time. Uh, so if again, if you forget because we're not in class and you turn it in late, uh, it's a 30 point assignment and late assignments are only worth 50%. So that's 15 points right off the top, which is something you definitely don't want to do on this. So I encourage you as soon as you get it done to turn it in, uh, but make sure you turn it in on time. I still want it due on Friday because I want to be able to post the key so that you have the weekend to study the key to figure out. I won't have them graded by the time we get to the exam on Monday uh, in all likelihood because uh, I'm grading exams for the uh, 431 class right now. But um, once you submit it at 6 p.m. on Friday, the key will be posted so that you'll have the opportunity to go and see what you got and see what you got right and see what you got wrong and hopefully understand that information. Again, being the smart, sophisticated students that you are, uh, obviously this is material that a 30 point assignment is going to be represented on both the lab and the lecture exam. So this is important information to make sure that you understand. Uh, so having that key to help you to make sure you got things right uh, and understand the concepts is going to be important. So again, when you're done with it, uh, turn it in. So turn it in as soon as you're completed and as soon as you're satisfied. If you've already turned it in and now I've given you extra time, uh, it's okay to continue to work on it and turn in a second version and I will just grade the second version. I haven't bothered to look to see if anybody's turned it in yet. I should have done that. But like I said, I was changing all the due dates and everything this morning. That's why I was a little late getting here. Um, but again, I'm hesitant because I don't like having assignments due on the, uh, when we're not in class, but I think we'll benefit from Wednesday's group presentations uh, and it will help you to be more successful on that 30 point skeletal review. And since it does uh, matter for points, you know, correct answers uh, do are, you know, required for that and incorrect answers get wrong. I think it's worthwhile to do that. All leading up to one week from today when you have your lab and lecture exam. All right, questions on any of that? You guys did hear all of that, right? My microphone's on. Yeah, we got you. Yeah. Just making sure. Okay. You guys are particularly quiet this morning. Everybody hung over from uh, watching the exciting football game last night, apparently. All I right. I'm sorry. <laughs> I wish I was hung over. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Pregnancy. Uh, all righty. Trust me, being hung over isn't all it's cracked up to be. It's no, much I better know. Than Believe me. Really drunk. That's what I do. All righty. <laughs> Any other questions before we get started? Hopefully this makes sense. Everything's clear. All right. Excellent. So let's pick up where we left off. As I mentioned, we were working our way through the physiology of the bone. Remind me again, how many ways did we learn to make a bone? Two. And what were they? Um, Endochondrial and uh, uh intramembranous. Excellent. Ossifications, but yes, absolutely. Ossifications, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Nope, I got your point. How many ways did we learn to grow a bone? Two. Yeah, what were they? 
Um, interstitial growth and oppositional growth. True, but what those are the growth processes. But what are the oh. directions we learn to grow? Length and width. Oh, length and yeah, width. Length and width, exactly. Absolutely. Perfect. And how many important factors did we learn were necessary to maintain uh, the homeostasis of the bones? Three. Three. What were they? Uh, hormones. Hormones. Exercise. And. Uh, Nutrition, there you go, Sarah's nutrition. got it, excellent, <laughs> absolutely. And remember, when we talked about those, especially in particular when we talked about the hormones, as we learned, hormones don't only help us to maintain homeostasis of the bone, but they also play a huge role in our maintaining of calcium homeostasis. And remember, as we talked about, uh, when those two things are at odds, calcium is always going to win over the density of our bones. So we have done almost everything we need to do to understand how bones function properly, with the exception of dealing with the major homeostatic imbalance of bones. And that is, of course, repairing them after they break. So that is the last major physiological process we have to talk about in relation to bones. And of course, if we are going to heal a bone, then the first thing we have to do is break it. Breaking the bones. Right, and here we see some examples of some of the fractures, lots of different types of fractures, but in general, fractures can be divided into two main classifications, what are called closed or open, or what are also known as simple and compound, and both of those mean the exact same thing. What is the difference between a closed and an open fracture? What do you think the big difference is? Is it one bone versus multiple bones? No, no, that's a good guess. Uh, full break versus partial is a good guess. Those are always definitely ways that we want to classify bones. Uh, but there you go. Like just a crack in the bone? <clears throat> no, uh, is it Mitch, like it's punctured your skin? Yeah, out? exactly. Yeah. Mitch and Augustina, Ava, I've got it on the heel. Absolutely. A closed fracture is typically a fracture that is maintained within the cavity of the body. So it does not puncture through the surface of the skin. Whereas an open or a compound is when you see the bone. So if you see the bone, that is an open or a compound fracture, right? So, and whereas if you don't see the bone, if the bone is maintained within the skin, uh, then it is a closed or a simple fracture. All right, so exactly. However, as you can see from the illustration, that while there are these two big general classes, there are many different specific classifications uh, that we can use to describe fractures as well. So let's look at some examples of these. Of course, the most common, and we can cheat and use the whiteboard for this as well. We'll bounce back and forth. And again, for simplicity, I will just show the diaphysis of our bone here, uh, assuming it's a long bone. A transverse fracture is, of course, a fracture that does what? Is um, fractured horizontally? Yeah, in this case, it would be horizontally, although probably a better way to describe it. You're absolutely 100% correct. But a better way to think of it is in terms of it is perpendicular to the longitudinal axis of the bone. And yes, Augustina, to answer your question, uh, these different classifications we will talk about uh, are definitely uh, classifications you need to be aware of. Yes, absolutely. So know the two big general classifications, but also these specific examples as well. So absolutely, a transverse fracture is basically a fracture that breaks the bone in a perpendicular angle to the longitudinal axis. And how many bone pieces do you get as a result of a transverse fracture? Two. Two, exactly. Now, with a transverse fracture and other types of fractures as well, so we'll talk about some of the other ones that can uh, do this as well, a fracture can be also described as displaced. Whoops, don't need my cap lock anymore. What would it mean if a fracture was displaced? Off its joint. That's a, so true. A joint can be displaced as well. But when we're talking about a fracture, what does that mean 
when the fracture is displaced? Oh, it's it's displaced off the bone completely? Yeah, it's not lined up anymore. So we the two ends of the bone can be such that they no longer line up with each other, right? So when we get that displacement of the bone, not only does it break, but it also is no longer properly aligned. If we go back to uh, the pretty picture from the textbook, here we see an example of that transverse fracture and we can see how it is partially displaced. However, notice this one, and we'll talk about the type of fracture this is in just a second. Notice this is a much more severe displacement where again, the bones are no longer properly aligned with each other. So again, transverse is a, a fracture that is commonly uh, displaced, uh, but there are other types that can uh, cause a displacement occur as well. Here we see an extreme example down here beneath it. Uh, so we'll talk about some of these other different types, but this is the, the most basic type of fracture. You have a simple transverse fracture along the longitudinal axis of the bone, and it can be displaced or still aligned with each other. Excellent. And that would probably take a lot of force or if they have like osteoporosis or something to break like that in the picture where it's like completely displaced. This one down here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, obviously, yes. So I just, yeah, typically more force is with a displacement. And you think about it also, it, it, it typically it, it's gonna require a displacement for it to break through the skin. So any open fracture is almost certainly a displaced fracture uh, because otherwise I can't think of a way that the bones could stay aligned and still puncture through the surface of the skin. So I think by definition, I think almost all open fractures are probably gonna be displaced fractures. All right, <clears throat> but let's talk about a different type of fracture here. This is one that is known as a comminuted fracture. Remember when we were cheating, go back to our whiteboard, um, erase some of this stuff. With our transverse fracture, one bone is break, broken into two pieces. However, with a comminuted fracture, instead what happens is the bone is broken into three or more pieces. In this case, you are getting a shattering of the bones, not just a clean, simple break, but you're getting a shattering of the bone into multiple pieces. Now, is everybody's bones equally likely to have this occur to them? No. 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 What, who would be more likely to get a commonuted fracture? Grandma. Yeah, exactly. Elderly people. <laughs> Members, we talked about... <clears throat> Excellent. People with osteoporosis because they have less bone density. But remember the other thing that we talked about, what gives bone its flexibility and its give are those collagen fibers. As we talked about, those babies, those infant bones are just filled with co uh, uh, collagen. So they practically bounce, right? Little kids fall all the time while they're walking and they bounce right back up and they get at it again. When grandma falls while she is walking, does she bounce right back up as a result of that? No. No. And one of the reasons is not only because, as mentioned, uh, could the grandma be dealing with osteoporosis where she's losing bone density, but as we age, as we know, we continue to take those hydroxyapatite crystals and deposit it onto the collagen fibers. So as the bone becomes more and more and more ossified, it loses that flexibility, it loses that give. And so it becomes hard, but it also can become brittle. And so as a result of that, you're much more likely to get that shattering of the bone that you see with that comminuted fracture. So again, we see this often with, like I said, elderly people who fall, shatter their hips or their legs as we see things along those lines. So it's much more common uh, because of that brittleness that occurs in the bones. Oh, I like that. Community homes, comminuted fracture. Oh, I like that a lot. That's clever. Excellent. Conversely, a type of fracture that is more common in younger individuals is a spiral fracture. A spiral fracture comes from a rapid twisting of the bone. Uh, this is a common type of fracture that can occur uh, during sports, 
that running back is running down the field and he's tackled and the leg is twisted as he's tackled and you can get that that way or that soccer player is running across the field and steps into that gopher hole and they get a twisting of the leg as a result of that so these types or even um you know little billy's bouncing on the couch and is about to fall onto the glass uh, coffee table so mom grabs and as she grabs and twists the arm to pull him away from the coffee table that twisting of the arm can lead to that spiral fracture at least that's what you tell child protective services um, but that type of a twisting force uh, causes that spiral break and again uh, you know my limited artistic skills so I'm not going to go back to the whiteboard and try to draw this but you can see uh, this more angular type of uh, breaking of the bone it isn't multiple pieces so it's not a it's not shattering uh, but it's also not a smooth transverse fracture uh, that is incurring as well so typically these twisting types of fractures leave a more jagged edge as you can see from this one here and with this more jagged irregular edge uh, it is one that can be slightly harder to um to heal. So sometimes they'll put a rod in the uh, in the uh, medullary cavity of these or uh, stabilize it with plates or something like that because it can be a little bit more challenging to get this bone to align properly and we need it to align properly to be able to heal properly as well. All right, questions on that? Another type of a fracture is what is known as a compression fracture. Notice this is a common fracture that can occur within the vertebrae associated with, um, oh, great question. I'm sorry, Sarah, I missed that before. Uh, the spiral, I'm assuming you're talking about the spiral? Yeah, I, I guess Technically, it could be possible that maybe like a little piece of this could break off. You could get a little bit of small bone pieces as a result of this, but typically it's the two major pieces uh, that will occur in that. So you, you, it's not the same kind of shattering. Could you get more peripheral debris as a result of this one? Yes, but I think you would still consider it to be primarily two pieces. Yeah. Great question. I'm sorry, I did, didn't catch that. It was there. I apologize. Thank you for that. Excellent. All right. Notice a compression fracture is one that is common in the vertebrae. These are uh, often associated with falls. Someone is ice skating or someone is rollerblading or as in my first year of sleepaway camp, a little Timmy was sitting on the top bunk of his of our bunk bed in our cabin. He jumped off of the bunk bed on the cabin and landed on his butt. As a result of that, he had the acceleration of falling from the top bunk down to the ground and then hitting the ground where you get the force of the ground coming up to meet him. And on the very first night of sleepover camp for the summer, he had a compression fracture in his vertebrae and had to be uh, wheeled away in an ambulance. So like I said, these are very common associated with uh, falls in the vertebral column. And notice the key with the compression is you are getting the two accelerating forces uh, from the different directions. Uh, so as a result of that, you basically get a crushing, a pulverizing of the bone in between. The other place where these types of compression fractures are common are actually in unsuccessful suicide attempts. You have an individual who decides to end it all and jumps off of a bridge. And as they go accelerating down towards the water, and then they hit the water feet first, uh, you basically get the compression of the bones of the leg. So you will often see these types of compression fractures in the femur or in the tibia of individuals who have failed to commit suicide. Now, you probably see in the ones that were successful that committed suicide, but having a broken bone if you successfully committed suicide is the least of your worries, right? So obviously we don't care about it in those people, but for those that survive, it's not uncommon for them to have these types of compression fractures within the bone where you're getting those, uh, those dual forces basically compressing the bone in between as it is named. This is similar. 
stepping on your back. Um, I would think you would be more likely to cause a displacement of the cervical vertebrae from something like that. The other thing that it might be, I haven't heard of an injury like that um, because you don't have this dual forces from both sides. If there were some type, like maybe a rib or something like that could uh, be broken from that, maybe you could get compression of the rib or what it would more likely be would be a depression fracture. A depression, uh, blah, blah, blah. A depression fracture is similar to a compression fracture. The difference is the pressure is just coming from one side. So again, this is typically uh, when you are riding your bike or skateboarding without your helmet and you fall and you hit, or uh, your wife has told you to take out the garbage for the umpteenth time and you keep forgetting to do it. So she finally gets fed up and comes at you with the hammer. As she hits you in the head with the hammer, you get that depression of the bone from that force coming in just one direction. So obviously this would be more of a depression. So I would think that if, if someone, if you were to break a bone by someone standing on your back, and again, I'm not familiar with the case where that would have happened. My guess is that would be more likely to be a depression type of fracture. These are common in the skull, but again, remember, as I mentioned, if you happen to see your loved one coming at you with that uh, hammer, you could put up your arm and then get that depression fracture in a, in a lateral bone, right, as a defensive wound or something like that. But typically, the force is just coming from one side with that type of a, uh, of a fracture. So similar to compression, uh, but uh, slightly different. As I mentioned, there are big differences between the skeleton of uh, an adolescent versus uh, an elderly individual and even an adult. One of the basic examples of that is the epiphyseal plate. As we know, in the metaphysis between the epiphysis and the diaphysis is that chunk of hyaline cartilage. And that chunk of hyaline cartilage is a region that hyaline cartilage is weaker than bone. So if a force is exerted onto the side of a bone, that epiphyseal plate, which is weaker tissue, is a weak spot on that bone and you can get a fracture that occurs on that epiphyseal plate. Now, these types of fractures are a little bit more concerning uh, first of all, clearly they can only happen. Hold on. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, you know, thank you. They can only happen in someone who has an epiphyseal plate. So typically by the time someone reaches, like we said, for between 18 and 25, and that epiphyseal plate has closed, it's become a thin line of compact bone. So it's not, so it's probably a stronger location than it was before. But the other thing that is a concern is, as we'll see in the healing process, a fracture that occurs on the epiphyseal plate has an increased likelihood of that epiphyseal plate ossifying prematurely. And why would that be a concern if your epiphyseal plate uh, ossified prematurely? So you wouldn't grow anymore? Right. Or so wouldn't suddenly, allow the bone right. to grow in length? Exactly. You have a, a humerus here that has two epiphyseal plates, but if I break uh, the epiphyseal plate here on my humerus here and it ossifies prematurely, then on this arm, I'm only going to have one that's going to allow it to grow in length, whereas this one, I'm going to have two that's going to allow it to grow as break, in length. And as a result of that, one arm is going to be shorter than the other, right? I'm wearing custom shirts for the rest of my life. And while buying custom shirts or hemming uh, one cuff is a little bit inconvenient, if you think about if something like this happens in the lower appendages, where we're weight bearing, where we're walking, right, having one leg shorter than the other is something that could be a concern. And obviously, the earlier this ossifies early, the more severe the problem is. So a uh, epiphyseal fracture in a three-year-old is probably much more concerning than epiphyseal break in a 17-year-old. 
right? Because they're not going to be growing as much uh, during that time. So again, it can have some uh, severe implications. So typically when the fracture occurs on the epiphyseal plate, they watch it a little more closely. Unfortunately, there's not much that can be done to discourage it from ossifying prematurely, but it is something that they watch because it's something that we need to be aware of. All right, questions on that? All right, obviously an epiphyseal fracture is one that can only occur in an adolescent and someone who still has an epiphyseal plate. Another fracture that typically only occurs in adolescence is what is known as a green stick fracture, right? Now, again, most of you have some familiarity with this or hopefully have some familiarity with this because you go camping for the weekend. And of course, one of the best parts of camping is the nighttime fire where you get to do your s'mores. And when you go off into the woods to get a stick to roast your marshmallows, do you go to that new sapling tree and try to whip, rip off one of its limbs as a result of that? No. No. How easy is it to rip off that limb off that sapling? Not easy. Yeah, it doesn't just snap. It bends. It has tremendous flexibility. It bends. And if you keep bending it, eventually it'll kind of start to shred right? As, as you continue to bend it and bend it and twist it around, it starts to shred. Well, that's exactly what happens with our bones in this case. In that adolescent, remember, as we talked about, there is a lot of collagen fibers. And because there are a lot of collagen fibers, it gives the bone more flexibility. It gives the bone more give. So we put this force on the bone. And that force causes the bone to start to break. So you get a, oh, no, hold on. Don't want an arrow there. You get a partial break of the bone. But what happens is because of all of the collagen in the bone, you get a compression of the collagen on the other side of the bone. And so as a result of this, you get a fracture on one side, that partial break on one side, but on the other side, it is able to compress and is undamaged as a result of that. So basically you only get a fracture that goes part of the way through. Now, depending on how much it bends, you can, much like that green stick uh, that you're trying to get off that sapling, you can get a partial shredding of the bone that can occur on the side where the break occurs, but it is typically a break that does not go all the way through. All right. So another advantage of one of those bendy, flexible bones of being an adolescent. Questions on that? All right, so those are the main specific types of fractures. So know your two common classes, know these specific types of fractures, but as we also know, anatomists love to name everything. So there are also plenty of examples of very special breaks that get unique names as a result of that. And there are literally dozens of them. I'll give you two uh, because uh, it amuses me to do so. Uh, one example of this is what is known as a Coles fracture. A Coles fracture basically occurs uh, from when a person is trying to catch themselves when they fall. So you're roller skating or you're ice, uh, uh, ice skating or, or rollerblading or skateboarding or something like that. And as you fall and as you fall forward, you put your hands out to catch yourself. As you get that force on it, and again, that's one of the reasons why when you skateboard and you rollerblade, you're supposed to wear those special gloves that have the metal bar in here to provide that support for catching yourself to avoid a Coles fracture. Uh, what happens is that you get a transverse fracture that always includes the radius, but sometimes includes the ulna. 
uh, from catching yourself in that fall. So you get basically by the distal epiphyses of the radius and ulna, you get a transverse fracture that occurs there from the catching yourself while you're trying to fall. So that's an example of a Coles fracture. However, my favorite special break is what is known as a Potts fracture. A POTS fracture basically occurs, and I'm holding my hand up because I'm not going to hold my foot up to the screen, uh, but basically you step on, uh, you, you, you step in a hole or something like that that causes a twisting force to your uh, lower limb. As a result of that, you get a fracture of both the tibia and the fibula uh, that occurs from that twisting motion. So it can be a spiral or a tri transverse fracture of both the tibia and the fibula uh, from stepping into a gopher hole or from stepping onto the edge of a curb. If you partially step on the edge of the curve and as a result of that, your foot gets twisted, it can cause those bones to break. And that's exactly what happened. One day, this young doctor was walking down the street talking to a fellow uh, a surgeon they were walking down the street. He stepped on the edge of the curve and he stepped on the edge of the curve. He twisted his foot, broke his ankle with that twisting force down at the uh, distal portion of the tibia and the fibula. And while he laid there writhing in pain, he thought, hey, it would be great to write up this type of injury and submit it to a medical journal. And that's what he did. And they named it after him. So good old Bob Potts was walking down the street broke his ankle, and his first thought was, hey, I'm going to send this to a medical journal, and they named the fracture after him. So there you go. All right, so we talked about the two main classes. We talked about several uh, specific types of fractures and even a couple special breaks. Correct. If both the tibia and the fibula are not broken, it is not considered a pox fracture. That is correct. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. So now we have broken our bones. Our goal now is to fix them. Now, obviously, as we've talked about, there are gonna be some differences in how these things are gonna heal. A transverse fracture and a compression fracture are not necessarily going to heal the same way. So there can be some variations in this process, but the four main steps that are involved are going to be the same pretty much regardless of what type of fracture it is. But for simplicity, we will deal with a transverse fracture. So let's go ahead and do this. Let's go ahead and clear this. Let's go ahead and look at my. It's over here, so I have plenty of room to write. We need a medullary cavity. We need a periosteum. And of course, we can cheat a little bit here. We know our periosteum is going to contain inside of it our mesenchymal cells. And I know these cells are way too big for the scale of what I'm drawing here, but that's all right. I don't care. I got my mesenchymal cells, periosteum, diaphysis of my long bone, and everything else. All right. So the first thing that happens is we get a break. So let's break our bone here. Okay. 
So we have a transverse fracture of our bone. With this fracture, obviously, one of the first major things that is going to occur, because again, remember, uh, not only is the bone damaged here, but obviously, as we know, bone is very well vascularized. So as a result of this, we break the bone and we damage the blood vessels. And those blood vessels rupture. When those blood vessels rupture, what's gonna happen? It's gonna fill with blood and get inflammation. Exactly, you're gonna get a lot of bleeding that is gonna occur. You're gonna get a swelling of blood that is gonna occur within this area. And what would we call that swelling of blood? Synovitis. Oh, come on, you know this. So when you have blood swelling in an oh. area, when an area swells with blood, what do we call it? There we go, we call it a hematoma. Oh yeah. So a hematoma forms in the area. Right? Why do we want all this blood coming to the area? Excellent. It's going to bring our platelets, our thrombocytes, to help to, for the clotting. But it's also going to bring our white blood cells, which are going to uh, help to attack any harmful pathogens that are in the area. Uh, we are going to bring oxygen and nutrients to the area to help in the healing process. So bringing all that blood to the area is important in that process. However, that swelling, remember what else travels with the blood vessels as well? Nerves. And Nerves. So it is going to be very painful. Why is it important that this is painful? Is it a good thing that so it's it sends signals to start uh, like the regeneration? Yeah, some of it can start the healing process. Why else is it important that it is painful? So you don't um, do anything to worsen it? Exactly. So that you know you're injured. If you've broken a bone in your leg and it hurts like heck, are you likely to go for a 5K walk? No. no, probably not, because that pain basically tells you you're injured and you should protect it. However, the other issue with bursting all of those blood vessels is that it disrupts the blood flow to the area. And so as a result of that, obviously some of the bone has been damaged from the initial injury, but this disruption of the blood flow can cause other bone tissue to die. If, for instance, the osteocytes in this area right here aren't able to get the oxygen, the nutrients that they need, those osteocytes are going to die inside of that bone matrix. So not only can, uh, can bone be damaged from the original injury, but there can be other areas where the bone dies as well from the disruption of the blood flow. So dead bone can form in that area. All right. Questions on that? All right, so we've broken up and damaged all of this bone. But luckily, we have these mesenchymal cells in the periosteum. And since we've broken uh, the bone, then we are going to be able to use those mesenchymal cells Uh, are stimulated by the chemical signals of the injury. To divide and make new cells. And since we've broken the bone, what kind of new cells are our mesenchymal cells going to form? Osteogenic. Exactly.
Exactly. They're going to divide to form chondroblasts and fibroblasts. Wait, what? Didn't you say osteogenic cells? Shouldn't we be making bone in this area? Yes, but do we have to repair the cartilage first? Yeah, you've got the right idea, exactly. It makes sense to make bone. And remember, there is no cartilage in this area in a mature bone, right? In a mature bone, this isn't cartilage. It's bone with red bone marrow in the middle and everything else that we expect a long bone to have. But, but our this, bone is made out of cartilage, right? Hyaline cartilage? True. Originally in utero as a baby, and you're absolutely right. We then took cartilage and converted it into bone. And so even though we're not babies anymore, even though we're not in utero anymore, as we mentioned, life is lazy. And so as a result of this, it's going to use what it knows. Guess what chondroblasts make? Hyaline cartilage. Well, they make cartilage. Oh, you're right about cartilage. that. They make cartilage. What do fibroblasts make? Connective tissue. Well, specifically, what do fibroblasts make? Fibers. Fibers, and in this case, collagen fibers. So as a result of this, what forms in this area? Well, let's do it this way. What is going to form in this area is a big chunk of cartilage that has a massive amount of collagen fibers in it. So basically together, these make a chunk of fibrocartilage. This fibrocartilage forms what we call the uh, cartil uh, the pardon me, the cartilaginous callus or the cartilaginous cap. Would either of these be considered oppositional or no. interstitial or is at it this just point, not? At this point, it is just making a chunk of cartilage in this space. Okay. All right. This fibrocartilage callus, this fibrocartilage cap forms. And this forms relatively quickly. This can occur in as little as a few hours. Now, what is the advantage of this? Sorry, you cut out, what was that? What is the advantage of making this chunk of fibrocartilage here in the site of the injury? Minimize displacement. Yeah, well, exactly. So what's gonna happen here is it stabilizes the injury, holds the pieces together, and as was pointed out earlier, as we know, does the body know how to turn cartilage into bone? Yes. Yeah. So it is also going to basically form the template for the bone formation. All of which is an awesome thing, except for one issue. You were, like every Sunday, you and your buddies get together out in the park to play mud football, right? And being the big confident woman that you are, even though you got tackled and your arm hurt like heck, you couldn't let your buddies know that. So you continued to play for the whole game on Sunday, even though your arm hurt and it still hurt a little bit on Monday. And so on Monday night, you finally called to make an appointment with the doctor and they can't see you till Wednesday. So there you go rolling into the doctor's office three days after the injury to find out that the bone is broken. And what is often one of the first things the doctors do before they put you in a cast? X-ray. Say again? Um, an X-ray. True, obviously X-rays to know that it's broken, but even, at, so they take the X-ray and then what do they do often? What do they often have to do before they put you in a cast? An exam. Like a movement. Maria's got what I'm going for there. They break the bone again, right? They re-break the bone, right? So that they can set the bone. Now, are they really breaking the bone when they break the bone before you? they put you in the cast? No, they're screwing. No, they're putting it back together. 
No. Well, what they're doing is breaking up this fibrocartilaginous callus, this cap that forms. Because you broke that bone and then you waited three days. So in three days, this fibrocartilaginous callus formed. Now, when you broke that bone, what are the chances that those two bone pieces were perfectly aligned in exactly the way that you want them to be in your body when it heals? Very unlikely. Very unlikely. Even if it's offset a little bit, we don't want it healing like that. So what the doctors frequently have to do is break up this fibrocartilaginous callus so that they can then align the bone properly so that when it heals, it heals oriented the right way. So often when you hear about people having the, the doctors had to re-break the bone, they're not really re-breaking the bone. What they're doing is breaking up this fibrocartilaginous callus so that they can line the bone up properly so that it will heal properly as a result of that. The fibrocartilage callus is just a chunk of fibrocartilage. It is a chunk of fibrocartilage, okay. exactly. And again, it's going to stabilize the bone. It's going to be the template that we're going to be able to use to make new bone. But if we're going to use it to make new bone, we want to make sure it's aligned properly. Now, as we just mentioned, do we know how to convert cartilage into bone? Yes. Yes. How does that occur? Um, the chondroplast turned into um, osteoblast. No, There's a signal that, that tells mesenchymal cells to produce uh, osteogenic cells instead of True. And that's what from the periosteum. Happen? What has to happen even before that? Blood vessels. Hormones have to enlarge. Okay, there we go. Excellent. So remember, the first thing that is going to happen is that our chondrocytes are going to enlarge and get bigger, and the matrix is going to thin. And when the matrix thins, what happens to those chondrocytes? They calcify. Well, the matrix oh, they die. and what happens they die. to the chondrocytes? The chondrocytes die. And when they die, they leave a cavity behind. And then what can happen in that cavity? Blood vessels. The blood growing. vessels. Blood vessels are going to grow in. And as blood vessels grow in, what starts to happen then? We form an endosteum. Um, and it gets supplied with nutrients. And right. So we, we start bringing osteoblasts, which are going to start to make matrix, and they're going to make bone. And what kind of bone is going to fill this space? Is it's it going to be shape. perfectly aligned, perfectly arranged osteons? Or is it going to be a whole bunch of irregular points and processes? Irregular points and processes. Exactly. So what happens is using that process that we already understand, right? Chondrocytes die, leave a cavity, uh, oops. Uh, our blood vessels grow in. They bring uh, osteoblasts and osteoclasts. Our osteoclasts are going to break down. dead and damaged tissues, notice that is going to include the dead bone that formed from the loss of blood. So we're going to break down the cartilage that's been calcified. We're going to break down the dead bone that was there as a result of that. And then our osteoblasts are going to come in and they're going to fill this whole huge entire space with spongy bone. Now, is that what we want the finished healed bone to look like? A normal bone no. with a big chunk of spongy bone in the middle? No. 
No. At this point, the process is not done. However, at this point, this is typically when the cast comes off. Why? Because they want mobility. Like Why? they want um, because if I don't know, maybe it's too stiff if they leave the cast on and okay, well, maybe that's not a bad a guess. guess. It is a guess, <laughs> it's a good guess. But what else do we know about bone? Well, so let's think about this. So we make this big chunk of spongy bone. This big chunk of spongy bone is what is known hit. as the bony callus. So now we have a bony callus that fills the space. But as we mentioned, right? And at this point, it can handle being bone that's still in that space. A moderate amount of pressure. When you, oh, I know. So when you apply pressure, um, it stimulates more osteoblasts. Exactly. Absolutely. While it can handle a moderate amount of stress. So again, you shouldn't go running for five miles, but can you walk around the block? Yeah, absolutely. And as we know, as we talked about in the last class, the advantage of this is that that stress, that moderate stress that we put on the bone helps to strengthen and realign the bone. So again, we want that bone to get stronger. And as we know, a little bit of weight bearing activity, a little bit of gentle walking on it can help to do that. And in fact, that is the fourth and final step of the process. Remodeling of the bone. Again, this process, depending on the type of fracture can actually take months to years for this to occur. It's going to involve both the osteoblasts and the osteoclasts. Because after all, we are going to need to use those osteoclasts to hollow out the medullary cavity. We're going to need those osteoblasts to align and arrange that compact bone within that region there. Uh, any swelling that may have occurred, we need to use the osteoclasts to break down any excessive bone that may have grown out of that area. And eventually, after this months or years of process, what happens to the relative strength of the bone? Is it ever going to be as strong as it was before? No. no. You're right, yeah. because it's going to be stronger. In most instances, you typically get as a result of this from the outside, you really can't, after years of remodeling, when you look at the outside of the bone, it is almost impossible to tell that it has been broken in that location. However, if you take an X-ray of the bone, one of the things that you can see, you can tell an old fracture by, is typically the compact bone is thicker in that area. The medulla is more narrow in that area. And if you think about it, if that area is thicker in compact bone, it's typically stronger in that location. Once a bone fully heals, it is actually more likely to be broken in a different location than at the same location that it was broken the first time. So like I said, it may take months or years, but typically by the time it fully heals, the bone is typically stronger in that location than it was before. All right. We did it here on the board. Let's do the same thing with all the pretty pictures and all the pretty words. Notice here, we have that fracture hematoma that forms. Our blood vessels burst. Remember, because we're disrupting the blood flow in this area, some of the bone that wasn't directly damaged by the fracture can be damaged from the loss of blood flow to that. So dead, dam uh, dead bone can form in this region. 
become swollen and painful so that we don't use it, so that we protect it. And those platelets, those white blood cells are gonna come in to help us to protect us from anything outside harmful and dangerous. Now, chemical signals from this damaged tissue are going to cause the mesenchymal cells here inside of the periosteum to become active, starting to divide and start to make new cells. And what are the new types of cells that these mesenchymal cells are going to form? Chondroblasts. Fibroblasts. Fibroblasts and chondroblasts. Fibroblasts and chondroblasts, absolutely. So fibroblasts are going to become active, forming lots of fibers. Chondroblasts are going to become active, forming a lot of cartilage. So you're going to get a big chunk of cartilage with a massive amount of collagen fibers in it, which is basically, if you think about it, what our definition of fibrocartilage is. Fibrocartilage is a chunk of cartilage with a massive amount of fibers in it. And so this fibrocartilaginous callus, or cap, forms in this area. We get a big chunk of fibrocartilage that forms in this area. This, as we talked about, stabilizes the bone and forms that framework where we can now convert this cartilage into bone. We can heal the bone process. Remember also, as I mentioned, this fibrocartilaginous callus can occur in as little as a few hours. So even if you break that arm and then you go to the hospital, you're sitting there in the waiting room for four hours before you finally get in to see the doctor. By the time you finally get in to see the doctor, a fibrocartilaginous callus could have already formed or partially formed. So again, they often have to re-break the bone to make sure that it is aligned properly. And of course, when they re-break the bone, they're not actually breaking the bone, they're just breaking up this fibrocartilaginous callus so that the bone pieces can be aligned properly. Now, the good news is we have now twice, once in making the bone and then once in growing the bone in length, have already converted cartilage into bone. So this is a process we know down pat. The Fibro, uh, pardon me, the chondroblast, pardon me, the chondrocytes get large, die, leave that calcified matrix behind. Blood vessels grow into the area, and osteoblasts are going to come in and make a big chunk of spongy bone. Notice this big chunk of spongy bone that now fills the space is what we call the bony callus or the bony cap. Remember any of that dead blood of uh, dead bone that was located in the area will also be replaced with spongy bone at this time. And now we have a little bit of bone holding the two ends of our bone together. So like I said, at this point, our fracture is stabilized and can handle a moderate amount of stress. Notice the healing process is not done, but this is when the cast comes off. Because as we learned, not only is it important to eat right, not only do you have hormones that help us to regulate bones, but weight-bearing exercise, putting some moderate stress on that bone is going to help in the healing process. That final healing process, the remodeling, may take months or years to occur, but our osteoclasts are going to hollow out the medullary cavity. Our osteoblasts are going to form big, huge, thick chunks of compact bone lining the surface. Our osteoclasts will eat away the, any excess bone on the outer surface, giving it its normal shape again. Again, it can take months to years for this to occur, but 
When it's done, typically the area has a larger amount of compact bone in it than it did before. And because it has a larger amount of compact bone in it, it is typically stronger than it was before the break. All right. Questions on that? All righty. With that, then, that is everything we needed to discuss for our bone physiology. We are done with our bone physiology. So what we're going to be able to spend uh, the rest of the class time doing is to get an introduction into our joints. And once we get an introduction into our classifications of our joints, uh, we will uh, be able to then spend the rest of our time on our bones and bone features. Now, I will warn you that uh, for this exam, I typically find the joints are the part that most people have the biggest challenge with. Um, I don't think it's because it is inherently hard. I think the challenge that people have is the vocabulary, right? Because it's a lot of terms we're not familiar with, like a synchondrosis or an amphiarthrosis or a gumphosis or a syndesmosis or things along those lines. One of the important things to remember when we're talking about our joints is that our joints, like most things that we've talked about, can be classified structurally and can be classified functionally. Now let's start easier. What do you think it means for a joint to be uh, classified structurally. What do you think when we say functional classification of a joint, what do you think we mean? Can you say that again? The arthrology. True. So you, you are correct. When we talk about joints, joints are also known as articulations. Uh, they are also known as arthroses. But functionally, wouldn't it be the motion that are? Yeah, exactly. Joints move? When we classify them functionally, basically what we're saying is how much movement do they allow? So when we classify a joint structurally, what do you think we mean? What's made of? Yeah, exactly. We have two bones. So really, what we mean is exactly what type of tissue holds the two bones together? Now, we've got a hint at this, because if you remember way back when we were talking about membranes, we talked about synovial joints with synovial membranes. So the other part of a structural classification, one is what type of tissue or tissues is holding them together. But we also know that some joints will have a cavity. So basically the second part is it does it have a cavity. So let's actually say it that way. Does it have a joint cavity? So those are the two questions we're asking with a structural classification. What type of tissue is holding the bones together and does it have a joint cavity? For our functional classification, it's how much movement do they allow? And Are the structure and the function of the joints related? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So do you think the tissues holding it together or whether it has a joint cavity is gonna affect how much movement it allows? Absolutely. Oops. Absolutely, they're gonna be related to each other. 
Now, there is a third thing we need to know. For most structural classifications, there are also specific types. So what that means on the exam, I could have two bones. And with those two bones, I could have a joint. And I could point a big fat arrow at this joint. And there's basically three questions I could ask. I could ask you for the functional classification of the joint. I could ask you for the structural classification of the joint, or I could ask you to identify the specific type of joint. Those will be the three questions that I will ask. And as we'll see, each of those have their own specific answer. So when I put on a joint, those will be the three questions that I will ask you on the lab exam. And I guarantee there will be joints in the lab exam. And I guarantee I will ask you these three questions. So we need to make sure we understand this information. Your book does an excellent job of identifying and describing this. However, in your handouts, is a, a handout that I provided that there's no homework assignment for. Uh, but uh, under, where is it? Under the lab handouts, excellent. There is a joints classification help handout. That does a nice job of this as well. Notice here are the structural classifications and the specific types. Here are the functional classifications. And what I really like on this last page is this last uh, page does a nice job of showing the relationship between structural classifications, functional classifications, and specific types of joints. So like I said, there's no homework assignment associated with these, but th with this handout, but it is a great review of this information. Like I said, your book does an excellent job of going over this material as well, uh, but uh, that handout does a nice job of concisely consolidating that information into one place, hopefully helping you to understand this material. All right, so we wanna dive into that material. Uh, before we do that, let's go ahead and take our first break. It is 9.10 now, so let's come back at 9.25, and at 9.25, we will discuss articulations. All right, any questions on any of that? All right, I'll see you guys in 15 minutes. Let's go ahead and get started. Any questions before we dive in? All right, let's talk about joints, or as I mentioned, articulations or arthroses. And basically these are the connection points between bones typically to some type of connective tissue that is going to attach these bones together. And basically their job is to give our rigid, hard uh, skeletal system uh, some ability to flex and move, some ability to, to you know, uh, move through space, some mobility. As we talked about, uh, the study of joints is the field of arthrology and the study that the movement of the bodies that those joints allow is the field of kinesiology. Now, as I mentioned, we're gonna classify joints in uh, one of two, three ways. Let's talk about the classifications and let's actually do this on the whiteboard. This will be fun.
There we go. It gives us plenty of room. All righty. As I mentioned, one of the ways we can classify bones is by their functional classifications. And remind me again what I meant by functional classifications. The ways it moves. Yeah. Functional classifications are basically the amount of movement that they allow. Let's give ourselves a teeny bit more room over here. And as it turns out, there are indeed three functional classifications. The first of these functional classifications is a sin arthrosis. Again, as I mentioned, all these fancy words, arthrosis, uh, arthrosis, of course, means joint. I-S is the singular. Synarthroses, E-S, would be the plural. If this is the noun identifying the joint, if we wanted to use the adjective, we would say it's synarthritic. So again, fun with vocabulary. But regardless of how you identify it, with a synarthrosis joint, how much movement does that joint allow? Not a lot. In fact, not just not a lot, but how about none? None. <laughs> right. Can you give me an example of a joint where no movement is allowed in that joint? Mm, our ribs. Well, that's not really. Yeah, no, the ribs we need to move. I don't think I could think of a place where I have joints that don't allow any movement. Hmm. Oh, um, our skull. There you go. How about like those our... sutures? Absolutely. The sutures of our skull are joints that we don't want flexibility of movement up here. The joints, the bones are rigidly held together and don't allow any movement. That is a synarthrosis. Excellent. The second functional classification is amphi arthrosis. Again, uh, arthrosis means joint. When I say amphi, what does that make you think of? Where else have you heard that term amphi? Amphibian. Amphibian. <laughs> no, you're absolutely correct. And what's special about amphibians? They can go on land and in water. Exactly. They don't live just in land or just in water. They're kind of in between. They do both. And that's the deal with an amphiarthrosis. An amphiarthrosis is not like a synarthrosis where there's no movement allowed. But it also is not a free moving joint. So basically it is a joint in between. This is a type of joint that allows a very limited movement. So it allows a very limited or restrictive movement. All right. An example of this, for instance, would be our vertebral column. We talked about how that fibrocartilage helps to hold our vertebrae together, allowing some flexibility of movement. You can twist, you can bend. However, can you bend your back like so that it's completely at a 90 degree angle? Or no. 40, um, you know, 110 degree angle or something like that? No, so it allows a limited movement in those places. So that is an amphiarthrosis. And the third functional classification is a diarthrosis. A diarthrosis is a, a joint that allows a free range of motion. However, we have to be careful when we talk about a free range of motion. Notice for instance here, this joint between the bones of my fingers allows a complete free range of motion. However, can I get my finger to go over like this to the side? No, no. I mean, technically I could, I'd be running to the doctor afterwards, but it's not a way that it normally moves. So notice while it allows a free range of motion, 
it can be limited in the axis of that movement. So again, here between the bones of my fingers, I can move just on this forward and backward axis. However, here where my finger meets my palm, not only can I get it to move forward and backward, but notice I can also get it to move back and forth. So notice I have more axes of motions there than I do between the fingers themselves. So a diarthrosis allows for a free range of motion but it can be limited on the axis, north, south, east, west, or even multiple axes of movement can be allowed. All right, so every joint in your body is gonna fall into one of these three classifications. Questions like the, on? Uh, ball and socket, it would be like a free range of motion? Yeah, where I can absolutely, go in, in fact, it would, the ball and socket would be the freest range of motion, absolutely. All right. Excellent. So questions on that? I think that's the easy one. Another easy one though is our structural classifications. Oops, sorry, that's not right. With our structural classifications, remember uh, there are two criteria we're looking for. The type of connective tissue that holds the bones together and whether or not there is a cavity. So these are the things that we are looking for for our structural classifications. And it turns out there are four structural classifications. Let's start with the hard one first. A synostosis. With a synostosis, does anybody have any idea what type of connective tissue holds the two bones together? Island cartilage? It's not a bad guess. It's not a bad guess at all, but maybe it would help if I gave you the common term. Now, again, remember you're not allowed to use this common term on the exam, but commonly, a synostosis is also known as a bony joint. So when I tell you that a synostosis is a bony joint, what kind of connective tissue do you think holds the two bones together? That's a regular. Not a bad guess, but it is a bony joint. Bone. There you go, bone. See how simple that is? <laughs> Absolutely. In this case, it is bone connective tissue that holds the two bones together. Excellent. Now, let's think about this for a second. As we've talked about, is there a relationship between structural classification and functional classification? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So if it is bone connective tissue that holds these two bones together, what do you think the functional classification of all synostoses are going to be? Synarthrosis. Exactly. So there you go. Call grandma on the phone and say, hey, grandma, what? guess what? All of your synostoses are synarthritic and she'll be very impressed and she'll send you 20 bucks in the mail. And as cool and fancy as that sounds, all you basically told her is that bones that are held together by bone connective tissue don't move. All right, see how fun and easy that was? All right, good news is it gets easier. 
Our second structural classification is a fibrous joint. What type of connective tissue do you think holds bones together with a fibrous joint? Dense or regular? Exactly. Well, yeah, exactly. Or a fibrous connective tissue, like dense or regular, uh, holds. <coughs> Actually, let's put it that way. Excellent. The third structural classification of a joint is a cartilaginous. And with a cartilaginous joint, guess what type of connective tissue holds the bones together? Um, cartilage and fibrocartilage. Right, so again, cartilage. cartilage. <laughs> And that brings us to our fourth structural classification for a joint, a synovial joint. Now, remember, there are two categories or two components to our structural classifications, the type of connective tissue holding them together, and also whether or not there is a joint cavity. Notice for the first three, we didn't mention anything about a joint cavity, but even though we just barely briefly talked about it, what do you find in a synovial joint? Synovial yeah, exactly. You find fluid, so there's a joint cavity. That joint cavity, as you mentioned, contains a fluid. What kind of fluid? Synovial, synovial fluid. Synovial fluid. Excellent. And what makes that synovial fluid? Synovial membrane. Exactly. So this joint cavity is lined by a synovial oops, membrane and it contains synovial fluid. And there are our four structural classifications. Questions on that? All right, excellent. However, remember we also mentioned that many of our structural classifications have specific types. And in the case of a fibrous joint, there are three specific types. So let's identify those. The first fibrous joint, uh, let's do A, is a suture. What's so special about a suture? Where have I heard that term before? In the skull. Yeah. These are found only in the skull where those two big plates of bone are basically held together by a fibrous connective tissue. So basically a fibrous connective tissue basically knits the two bones together. Now, we have a suture here. And based on that, what do you think its functional classification is going to be? Sunerthrosis. Excellent. So functionally, it is a sunerthrosis. Does not allow any movement. All right, 
Now, let's cheat for a second here. Uh, I need to bring up a picture. Hopefully. Our Cosumnes River site has it. So let's explore together. Skeleton. Now oh, these are the individual bones. That's not going to help me. Where can I find that? All right, hold on a second. Let me uh, try something different. This will work. Perfect. This is what I want. All right. Here's an image of a chart that we have in the classroom. We can see this here is a, a nice image of the skeleton intact. We can, I'm assuming somewhere, somehow, scroll up through it. But what I'm actually interested in is I want us to focus up close here on the two bones of the forearm, the radius and the ulna. Notice when we look at the radius and the ulna, and here are those two bones, there's the radius, here's the ulna, and we'll talk about them and how we figure which is which later. But what I want you to notice in between them, there is this membrane this big, long, flat membrane that connects these two parallel bones to each other. This membrane is called an interosseous membrane. So this is a membrane between these two bones. Notice over here are some ligaments that are holding these bones together. These types of ligaments or this type of an interosseous membrane where we have this either dense regular or dense regular connective tissue, so a fibrous connective tissue holding these bones together, this type of a joint is what we refer to as a syndesmosis. So B, wrong color. So a syndesmosis is a joint that is formed that is formed by a ligament or an interosseous membrane holding the bones together. Now, Let's think about that here. These two parallel bones in our forearm, are they freely able to move in relation to each other? No. No, of course not. However, are they rigidly held in place and immovable at all? No. No. So notice this membrane that holds them together allows them to kind of twist, to compress, to move, but not completely free moving. So it allows some movement, but it's a very limited movement. Based on that, what do you think the functional classification of a syndesmosis is? There you go. And again, remember, I don't care how you pronounce these things as long as you spell them correctly. 
I like Augustina so to the click three. Excellent. Perfect. And last but not least, my favorite fibrous joint, because it is by far the most fun to say, is a gum phosis. Gum phosis, right, reminds me of chewing gum. And a gum phosis is indeed that. It is basically the peg and socket joint between the tooth and the jaw. Now, this is a little bit of a cheat. What, of course, are the two bones that make up your jaw? Maxilla and the mandible. Yeah, the maxilla and the mandible. So in that mandible, for instance, there is a socket, an alveoli, that the tooth is going to fit in. In the maxilla, there is a socket that that tooth is going to fit in. However, when we were counting the bones of the axial skeleton, were the teeth included in that? No. 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 Teeth are not actually bones. They are similar to bones. They have the enamel on the outer surface, which is similar to the matrix of the bone without the collagen fibers. On the inside, they have a material called dentin, which is kind of like a calcified uh, cartilage. But it, so it is a bone-like structure, but it is not a bone. However, it is like a bone. And more importantly, it is held inside of a bone. So what happens is there's a little bit of a fibrous membrane that is actually known as the periodontal ligament. And that periodontal ligament basically holds the tooth in place inside of the jaw. And so since there's a fibrous connective tissue that holds the bone-like structure of the tooth in the bone that is the mandible and the bone that is the maxilla, as such, we classify this as a special type of joint. So much like the suture, it, the gum phosis is found in one place and one place only, the skull, in particular, holding the teeth in place. And grab one of your teeth and wiggle it. Does your tooth wiggle inside of your jaw? No, for sure. <laughs> so then what would the functional classification Synarthrosis. of, oh, there you go, Sarah's got Synarthrosis. it. Synarthrosis. Synarthrosis. Excellent. And there you go. Those are the three specific types of fibrous joints. Questions on that? Does that mean for the synostosis, there's only one like structural classification and not specific types since we didn't go over it or? Yeah, if you think about it, when a bone is held together by bone, they're really by a bone connective tissue. There really isn't any specific types. Right. Okay. There's no specific types. All right. And I'll do you one better. I know, see, this is where it gets a little challenging because has anybody had an opportunity to go to the open lab and looked at the bones? Oh, yeah. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. A couple of, have you looked at the skulls? Yeah. Have you looked at the sutures? Yeah. When you look at the sutures, do you see a fibrous connective tissue that holds them together? No. The reason for that is, as we know, a fibrous connective tissue is made up of collagen fibers. And what do osteoblasts love to do to collagen fibers? Eat to digest them, eat them. Yeah, they love to deposit that matrix on them and turn them into bone. As our sutures age, as we become mature adults, what actually happens is that fibrous connective tissue of our suture actually gets converted into bone. So as we age, what actually happens to our sutures 
is actually it becomes bone connective tissue that holds them together eventually. So eventually our sutures actually become synostoses. Now we still call them sutures by name, but technically they ossify. Yeah, and once you ossify, once you become bone, there's no specific types. You're just a bone connective tissue holding two bones together and you are synarthritic. Um, at what age or point does that happen? Uh, different points for different bones. If you think about that baby's got that fontanelle, that big, huge opening in the back of their head, they've got a smaller one in the front of the head, they have those two fontanelles. Uh, so some of the sutures ossify much sooner, others uh, much later. So okay, the lambdoidal you. is one of the last ones to form. The squamosals are one of the first ones to fully ossify. So it, there's no set time. Okay, thank you. Yep. No, it's a great question, but uh, we don't have to worry about uh, labeling the timing of all of them because it's a little more complicated. All right. Excellent. So those are our fibrous joints. Let's move on to our cartilaginous joints. Now, as someone mentioned earlier, with the cartilaginous joints, cartilaginous joints can either be held together by hyaline cartilage or fibrocartilage. If you think about it, we have three types of cartilage. What's the third type of cartilage? Uh, elastic. Uh, elastic cartilage. cartilage. Elastic cartilage, like you find in your ear, right? Feel that cartilage in your ear. Is that what you would want to hold two bones together? Would you want to use this kind of cartilage to hold two bones together? No. 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 So we're just going to use hyaline cartilage and fibrocartilage. So two different types of cartilage. So not surprisingly, there are two specific types of cartilaginous joints. The first of these. Articular? No, articular cartilage is something totally different. We'll talk about that in a second, but you've got the right idea. We want hyaline cartilage and we want fibrocartilage in here. So our first type of cartilaginous joint is what we call a synchondrosis. And a synchondrosis is just a fancy way of saying two bones that are held together by hyaline cartilage. So we've got those two bones held together by hyaline cartilage. Probably one of the classic examples of this is the joint between your first rib and your sternum. I think we've talked about this in this class. What makes the world go round? Pressure. 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 Absolutely. Right. And so basically your ribs work like a handle of a pail. You know, if you think about the way a handle of a pail can swing up and down, when that handle swings up, the space inside of your thoracic cavity gets bigger. So as it gets bigger, the volume goes up, pressure goes down, and when the pressure goes down, air comes into your lungs. When you then swing the ribs down, volume goes down, pressure goes up, and the air comes out. So that ability to change the shape of our thoracic cavity is what moves air into and out of our lungs, a vitally important process. However, that swinging of the handle of the pail only works if you have a hinge point. And in the case of the ribs, that hinge point is this joint between our first rib and the sternum. So that is an example of a synchondrosis. However, if you think about it, we have also already talked about another example. Remember, we have two bones held together by hyaline cartilage. Well, if you think about it, we have a diaphysis of a bone, we have an epiphysis of a bone, and in that adolescent, what holds those two things together? Epiphyseal plate. Epiphyseal plate, which is what kind of tissue? Hyaline. Hyaline cartilage. Hyaline cartilage. So notice we have two, in this case, at least two bone pieces held together by hyaline cartilage. So if you think about it, the epiphyseal plate is 
is an example of a synchondrosis. which also helps us to know its functional classification. Because how much should that head of your epiphysis wiggle around on top of your diaphysis while it's growing? None. None. So functionally, it is a sin arthrosis. So on the exam, I guess we're supposed to, if you like point a picture at a joint, we need to know all of the joints and all of like their functional, so, structural? No, I, so I'm not gonna just randomly pick some joint out of the body, but are there lots of obvious examples of these and do you need to need, know at least one or two obvious examples of all of these? Absolutely. Okay, yeah. so it's not like gonna be on the lab exam that it's just, cause I was like, okay, so do we have to find and figure out every single joint in the body? Every single joint, no, but are, are you gonna need to know at least one or two obvious Exam examples yeah. of all of these? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, Augustina, as you mentioned, it's not that this information is necessarily hard. Like I said, so for this one, it's the vocabulary that's a little bit confusing. And let's take it one step further. What else do we know about that epiphyseal plate? Does it stay an epiphyseal plate forever? No. no. Eventually, it would ossify forming that epiphyseal line. And so if you think about it, once it becomes an epiphyseal line, once it ossifies, then it becomes a synostosis. You have a little bit of bone holding the two bones together. See, so again, it's not so much that it's a ton of new information, we're just adding a lot of vocabulary to what we're talking about. And of course, we actually already know the name of the second type of cartilaginous joint. It is a symphysis. A symphysis is where the bones are held together by fibrocartilage. And the classic example is that pubic symphysis. Let's go back and look at our chart. Remember the pubic symphysis, as we mentioned, is right here. It is that joint where the two pubic bones come together and there's that little chunk of fibrocartilage that holds them together. Obviously, they're forming the pelvis, your center of gravity, your base uh, for balance. So do we want these two bones just swinging like a barn door open and closed? No. No, of course not. However, if, especially if you happen to be a woman type person, do you necessarily want this so rigidly locked in place that there's no changing of the shape of it? So that as no, you're trying to pass that basketball indeed. out of there during childbirth? Right, exactly. So notice we want to have some flexibility of movement, but we don't want a completely free moving joint here. So what would our functional classification of a symphysis be? Anti-arthrosis. So does that mean in males it's only synarthrosis or is it no. both? It's an amphiarthrosis in males as well. Okay. The difference is in females during pregnancy, some of the pregnancy hormones actually loosen this fibrocartilage, making it more flexible, giving it more give, which is great because it helps to make it easier for the baby to pass through. But as we mentioned, this is the center of gravity, the center of balance. So typically a female who's in very late stage pregnancy, because of that looseness of a, the, the pubic symphysis, tend to get a very distinctive gait to the way they walk. All right, you can kind of tell, a, 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 notice I didn't say waddle, didn't say waddle, but uh, they, they take, get a very distinctive gait to the way they walk because of that loosening of the pubic symphysis. Notice also, In our, the other place where we talked about there being fibrocartilage holding bones together, these joints between the vertebrae, this intervertebral disc is another example of a symphysis. Like we talked about, it allows a limited range of motion, right? But you can't take your body and totally bend it at a 90 degree angle. 
So it's not completely rigid, but it's not a completely free moving joint as well. Notice also all of our symphyses are all on the midline of the body. The intervertebral discs and the pubic symphysis are all on the midline of the body. So all of our symphyses are located on the midline of the body. All right. Questions on this? All right. As Augustine, I think it was pointed out, I've thrown a lot of vocabulary, a lot of terms at you, and it can be a little bit cha challenging. So let's take a second and take a big breath. And notice one last thing. We have talked about our structural classifications and talked about our functional classifications and talked about our specific types. And so far, with all the joints that we've talked about, all of the structural classifications and all of the functional classifications, I mean, pardon me, all the structural classifications and all the specific types, what functional classifications have they all fallen under? The arthrosis and the amphiarthrosis. Excellent. Notice all of the joints we have talked about so far have either been amphiarthroses or synarthroses. None of them have been diarthritic. And that's because the only joints that are diarthritic are synovial joints. So all diarthritic joints and conversely, all synovial joints are diarthritic. So all of our synovial joints are diarthroses. All of our diarthroses are synovial joints. So that makes it easy. If you have a synovial joint, any specific type of synovial joint, it is all going to be diarthritic. If you have a diarthritic joint, they're all synovial. So that's the good news. The bad news is anybody know how many specific types? Yeah, we have like six. Yeah, there are indeed six. So there's a little bit more anatomy we need to do with these synovial joints. So we are going to need to talk about, it has the most complicated anatomy. or most complex, let's say it that way. And we have six specific types to talk about. So I think we will save the synovial joints to the next class. But for now, we'll leave it with this. So for the synovial joints, we will need to know two, around two examples for each two. Yeah, certainly, okay. absolutely. And Augustina, absolutely, that is an excellent point. Yes, we are going to talk about the anatomy of the synovial joint, identify the specific types of synovial joints and how they function properly. And then we'll actually talk about what can go wrong with that. What is the function of synovial fluid? Um, for friction. Yeah, it provides cushion, it reduces friction. So that is definitely one of the important functions of it. So if a joint lacks synovial fluid, you're more likely to impact the ends. You're more likely to damage the bone and the cartilage. You're really more likely to produce more friction. Uh, so that can cause more damage in the joint as well. The other thing we'll talk about is we'll, we'll see when we talk about synovial joints on Wednesday is the synovial fluid also maintains that articular cartilage. Remember articular cartilage is avascular. It doesn't have its own blood supply. So by having that synovial fluid bathe over the surface, it helps to maintain that cartilage. So with less synovial fluid, the, uh, the cartilage can become damaged, the cartilage can die and it can lessen, which again, impacts that joint. So yes, one of the major problems uh, that happen with joints as we age is we get a decrease in our synovial fluid that is produced and that can cause more and more damage to your joints. So yeah, absolutely. And we'll talk about that a lot more next class when we talk about these synovial joints in more detail. How are we on time? We are good. All right, so quickly, 
I've done this here and this is a great, again, this is exactly what's on that handout, shows all of this information. Notice if we go back to that handout, I think I still have it up. Do I still have that hand up? up? No, I do not. Yes, I do. So notice, as we just finished talking about, for our fibrous joints, there are three specific types, sutures, gumphoses, and syndesmoses. Notice sutures and gumphoses are both synarthritic, whereas our syndesmosis is amphiarthritic, right? Two specific types of cartilaginous, uh, Syncardrosis is synarthritic, symphysis is amphiarthritic. So again, and they've got examples. So notice there's this great handout that again has all of this material. But the last thing I wanted to do is I wanted to actually show you some examples of these joints. So we have the pretty pictures here. We've done all of this. Don't care about that. So here are the pretty pictures from your textbook that show these. So notice uh, our fibrous joint, our first fibrous joint here is the suture. Notice again, as we can see here, we have this fibrous connective tissue, uh, this fibrous basically ligament that uh, basically knits the cells, I mean, the, the two bones together. Sutures are only found in the skull. And what did we say their functional classification was? An arthrosis. Exactly, these are a arthrosis. And members, we also mentioned as we age, these sutures will actually ossify. And when they ossify, what kind of joint would they become? If that connective tissue holding them together ossifies into bone, then we then have bone connective tissue holding them together. Exactly. No. And that would be a synostosis. Excellent. Here, we see an example of one of those ligaments that I mentioned. And well, I wonder if our chart shows that. I wonder if we can see the bottom part of our chart. Is that as far down as it goes? That might be as far down as it goes. That'd be a bummer. Doo, doo, doo. Yeah, ah, this one, here we go. Perfect. All right, this one doesn't blow up big like the previous one did, but we can still see this. Notice also here in the lower leg, we have the tibia and the fibula, two parallel bones. And if you look closely at this, or if you get a chance to look at this chart in the classroom, once again, you will see that there is that fibrous ligament that interosseous membrane is found between the parallel bones. So the parallel bones of the forearm and the parallel bones of the lower leg have that interosseous membrane that sits between them. And those interosseous membranes or these ligaments are known as syndesmoses, made up of a ligament or an interosseous membrane. And what is their functional classification? Excellent, Sarah, amphiarthrosis. They allow limited movement. And our third fibrous is that gumphosis. Again, it's a teeny bit of a cheat because the bone, I mean, the tooth isn't really a bone, but it is close enough. It is a bone-like structure that needs to connect to a bone. And if you look closely here, you can see very nicely, they've done a job of showing this periodontal ligament, this fibrous connective tissue that holds the tooth in place in the socket. And so that peg and socket joint of the tooth is the gumphosis and your teeth should not wiggle around. So of course, functionally, they're a synarthrosis. I have a question regarding that. Yes. So why wouldn't it be amphiarthrosis? Because like when you're younger, you lose your teeth. So technically, like, they well, are able to wiggle. Uh, yes, but let's talk about why you lose your teeth. The reason you lose your tooth is that uh, 
that baby tooth, that deciduous tooth, there is a kernel of an adult tooth here underneath. And that adult tooth starts to grow. And as it grows and expands, as it grows upward and expands in this place, it erodes the root of the baby tooth. And as it erodes the root of the baby tooth, there's less and less ligament holding it in place, making that tooth more and more wobbly until it becomes so wobbly that it pops out. So notice it's actually the loss of the joint that makes it wiggly and pull out. So it isn't that the joint is loose, it's that big, you're losing the joint and that's what causes it. There's less and less ligament holding it in place. There's less and less of a root anchored into the bone. And so when that tooth falls out, you don't see the big long root that was there before. You basically just get the top part of it. So, yep. Did, did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Excellent. Perfect. All righty. Let's take a look at our cartilaginous, two specific types, two cartilage holding them together. A synchondrosis is hyaline cartilage. And like I said, the classic example they usually use is that joint between the first rib, that very special first rib, and the manubrium. But technically, the epiphyseal plate would also be considered a synchondrosis because you have two bones being held together by hyaline cartilage. And we don't want these things to be wiggly. We want them to stay in place. So functionally, there is synarthrosis. Plus, as we mentioned, when we age, that epiphyseal plate is going to ossify into a thin line of compact bone, becoming the epiphyseal line. And when it's epiphyseal line, what kind of joint would it be? Synarthrosis. Is synostosis, excellent. And then our second cartilaginous joint is a bones held together by fibrocartilage and they are a symphysis. Remember, as we talked about, they're only on the midline, the pubic symphysis or those intervertebral discs of the vertebral column. So they're all on the midline and they all allow a limited range of motion. They're all amphiarthritic. All righty, so there you go. Three of our four. We still have our synovial to talk about, but as you can see, the six specific types of synovial joints can vary dramatically from each other. So we need to talk about the general characteristics that they all share, then once we understand the general characteristics that they all share, we can talk about how functionally and structurally these six types are different from each other. But that's gonna take a fair amount of work. So I think that's a good thing to save for Wednesday because we wanna make sure we have plenty of time today for our bones and bone features. All right, questions on that? On Wednesday, will we have time to do like a little review? We should finish on time, depending on how long the group presentations take, we should have time for a question and answer review on Wednesday. So we are uh, ahead of the material well enough where I think that should be the case, okay? Excellent, all right, so let's go ahead and take our uh, next break. It is 10.16, so let's come back at 10.30. And at 10.30, we will do our quick introduction and then we'll, oh, actually, let's do it this way. I'm going to put you in our groups so we'll go into our breakout rooms so your groups have the opportunity to talk. So let's give you guys an extra five minutes to talk and do that. So we'll come back at uh, 1036. And I will break you guys into your groups uh, so that you guys can discuss uh, what we're going to go through. And I think group eight, you're the ones going first, right? Is group eight the one who's doing the, uh, the uh, wait, who's doing, who's doing the pectoral girdle? The scapula. We didn't really the discuss who was going or anything before. Well, but we have. Yeah. Also, hold on. Okay. So let's. Group eight is going first, the clavicle and the scapula. Yeah. Okay. That's what I thought. Okay. Perfect. Excellent. So, yeah, group eight is going to go first with the clavicle and the scapula. Perfect. Excellent. So, that's what we'll do coming back from the break. So, again, let's take a 20 minute break. Whoops. Wrong button. So, again, we will restart at uh, 10 26. I'm oh, sorry, not 26, 36. 37, 
take a 20 minute break. Uh, so go take your break now. I'll break you guys in your groups, come back and you can discuss uh, what you're gonna be doing and then we will restart at that point. All right, see you guys in 20 minutes. Actually, let's just stop the